good morning, I'm Morgan Donner and today I want to show you this exciting new project that I'm going to be working on, a late 14th, early 15th century style supported dress or kirtle. So as I usually do, let's start off with the historical versions of this, which is to say there kind of are none because it's kind of not a thing. Now, there are examples of heraldic clothing. You see it on a few different uh, burial effigies, both like statues and the, the brass plackets. And you see it a little bit in some manuscripts. But all in all, the evidence that actual people truly went about their everyday lives wearing clothing that essentially screamed, hi, I'm the wife of the Duke of such and such, not an actual thing, it's just kind of a sh visual shorthand for saying that this is a representation of this entity. So whether or not it's an actual period thing that people would have worn, doesn't matter. I'm still gonna do it. I'm super excited to make a heraldic style coat hardy or kirtle or dress or gown or whatever word you want to use for it. In my previous video I gave some quick pointers on how to draft a four panel style dress which this is the pattern I'm gonna use today. However, I have gone through the trouble of making a couple mock-ups to make sure that the draft fits as well as possible. Typically drafting out your measurements, putting them on paper, will get you close to something that fits you well, but probably not perfect, at least not for me. I always have to go through several mock-ups before I get it just right. So I'm going to be making this fabric out of some heavyweight 7.1 ounce linen that I got from fabric store, fabricstore.com. Linen isn't necessarily the most documentably correct fabric to use for a dress, but as I've already discussed, this probably isn't a dress that would have existed anyway, so I'm gonna do what I want. So linen fabric is what I went for, and I got it in the mail the other day. I made sure to first serge all of the edges, or well, zigzag the edges, this is not a serger, but whatever. Toss that into the wash, and that surging is going to protect it in the wash and keep it from fraying and losing several inches of fabric due to that fraying and tangling, and it's no good. It is now pre washed and ironed, and I'm gonna do a bit of fabric testing now to verify that I don't accidentally make a dress that bleeds onto itself. The fabric color bleed test went really well, so let's get started on the dress. Before construction though, I should probably show what I'm planning on making. My darling sunshine, Mr. Morgan Donner, and I have these really fun medieval-esque heraldry designs. They're, they're not from our family history or anything like that, they're just funsies. Mine is the red one and his is the green. I really love the idea of putting our designs onto a dress, much like the memorial statues and plaques I showed earlier. Super dang cute, right? Okay, design stuff done, let's go on to the actual making. Here's my paper pattern, both back and front. Let's take away the back and focus on the front piece for right now. You might be wondering where the heck the rest of this skirt is. Well, we'll add that as a separate piece soon. I never bother making an actual paper pattern piece for this section of the skirt. I just measure the length where the pattern cuts off and rotate it until I'm at the same angle as the hip. This is approximately what that missing skirt piece will look like. Enough about that, let's work on the main body piece first. I'm tracing around the pattern using white chalk. I like using chalk personally because in my experience it washes away without problems whereas sometimes some of the like various uh, pencils and markers I've had issues so chalk it is. Cut out the torso using the chalk marks as a guide. Now do the same thing for the back piece. Lay the fabric out, use the chalk to mark the pattern, cut the fabric torso piece out, and then place your brand new back piece on top of the front piece from a moment ago. The angle of the skirt at the hip is the same for both of these, at least on my pattern, so I can get away with cutting out both triangle pieces at once. Be careful where you start your triangle, 
since you must keep in mind that you will be taking seam allowance out where these two edges are sewn together. You don't want to end up with a weird notch missing here where the added triangle didn't go up as far as it should. It's much better to have the triangle be a little too long rather than too short. After all, you can always cut off excess if you made it too long. Use a ruler or something similar to make sure that you have the right angle and then trace along the edge with chalk. Just like I showed earlier, measure the length of the skirt at the start of the triangle and then use that measurement to determine the length of your new line. Cut the triangle out and then neatly line up the torso and skirt pieces. You might be tempted to sew the two together right now, but wait a second, there's a little trick to it. For those of you not familiar with fabric grain, a plain weave fabric like this one is going to be made up of perpendicular threads, much like a grid. The thread is sturdy and less likely to stretch along the straight grain, but will happily stretch along the bias. When making a skirt, if you have bias seams like this, then they are pretty likely to sag over time, causing sad and uneven headlines. But if you flip the triangles so that the bias is sewn onto a straight grain seam, then they won't be able to move, or at least not as much. We want to take advantage of that non-stretch and flip the triangle over so that the bias edge is going to be sewn to the straight grain edge. Pin the triangle to the main skirt piece here and then repeat all this to make a second pair of triangles for the other half of the dress. Sew the pin seams and then iron the seam allowance down flat. Remember when I said that it's better to have too much fabric because you can just cut off the excess? Well, now's that time. I'm going to cut the extra couple inches off so that everything matches the angle set by the original paper pattern at the hip. Are you worried about having an uneven line? Grab out that trusty ruler again and trace out a cut line, again following the angle of the skirt at the hip, which is in the lower right hand corner part of the screen at the moment. Now that the skirt is all in one piece, we can lay it out on another fabric and cut a lining to match. As tempting as it might be to simply cut out the lining right here and now as it's lying under the red fabric, it might result in sagging due to bias with bias. Instead, we'll do this right and mirror the construction method of the outer red fabric. One little extra thing though, I'm going to toss an additional layer of this white linen between the lining and the outer red fabric. This will act as a sort of inner lining layer to help provide some extra strength. For this style of dress, the waist and the bust seams are under a lot of strain, so a little extra support from the fabric in that area doesn't hurt. Pin everything in place so that the fabric doesn't shift around, and then do the same thing for the back piece. I'm going to want these three pieces of fabric to stay together for quite a while at this point, so to reduce shifting and to reduce the number of times I accidentally poke myself with a pin, let's just toss some basting stitches all around the edge of the torso. They don't have to be particularly neat, but if I am careful about keeping them within the seam allowance, then I won't have to remove them later. Bonus. I need to finish off the missing triangles for the white lining, so I'll add some fabric on top, and once I'm sure that the fabric is big enough to cover the remaining red section, I'll flip it over and start pinning. For those of you following at home, if you've been paying attention, you might have noticed that I just made a critical error. Can you guess what it is? Let's keep going for now and see how long it takes me to notice. So, <laughs> keep pinning and then sew the skirt seam on the machine. Iron the seam allowance open, which makes it lie beautifully flat and smooth. Then get rid of the excess fabric by following the outline of the red fabric underneath the white. I'll use this cut off piece of fabric down here to make the second triangle for the other side of the skirt quarter. And here's where I've discovered my mistake from earlier. See that pin sleeve, how it has a straight grain fabric on one side and bias on the other? That's how it's supposed to be. On the previous seam, I forgot to flip the triangle piece over, so I ended up with straight grain touching straight grain. Damn it. All right, fortunately, I don't think this is gonna be a big deal, since as long as I don't make the same mistake again on the other skirt piece that this will be sewn to, it'll still be on the straight grain and it'll still be up to that challenge of preventing bias stretch. It'll be okay, I think. So let's keep going. I'm basting the skirt layers, and that'll help keep everything really nice and smooth until I'm ready to sew all four panel pieces together. 
I don't need all this extra white lining fabric around the edges, so let's cut that away. And yet again, repeat all of these steps for the other half. I know that some of you out there are probably a little bit annoyed that I keep doubling up on my various steps, but I know that when I'm following a tutorial, it helps me to see a, a visual reminder that the steps need to be repeated sometimes. Otherwise, it sort of feels like things are skipping by too fast, and I, I feel like I've missed something. Now we are ready to join the two red panels. Line the side seam up, pin it to keep it lined up, and then toss this whole dang thing through the sewing machine. As always, iron the seam allowance open after sewing each seam. We'll worry about finishing the raw edges here later, and evening up the jagged bits at the bottom here too. So, remember the heraldry design stuff from the beginning? Now it's time to get the apron onto the skirt. It's going to go right about here, centered on the side seam. I nabbed the silk out of my stash. It was already hemmed because I was going to make it sort of a shoulder scarf partlet thing, but I never really end up using it, so now it's going to become a heraldic hip apron. I cut off some 2 inch strips to be the apron strings, and it'll look something like this. I'll double check that everything is even and pin the edges in place. I'll try to get these folds looking nice and ironing them down will help me visualize what it'll actually look like in the end. And of course, pin them all down too. This is now a very prickly apron. I really love how the silk has such a different sheen from the linen and it has a really interesting texture too. I'll stitch down the perimeter and each of these pleats with a very wide running back stitch. The apron embellishment won't be under any particular strain, so long stitches like this won't really hurt anything. For the apron strings, I'll join the two strips that I made earlier and then fold the sides in and stitch it down just like the pleats. Inside the dress, we'll want to take care of any unfinished seams by folding them under and stitching the seam allowance down inside the fold. So the red half of the body is all done, let's start on the green side. I have my lining fabric laid out and I'll trace the torso piece around the paper pattern. Using a ruler, I can continue the angle of the skirt past the point where the paper stops and just like the red half, I'm tossing an additional layer of linen in the torso as an inner lining. Pin the fabric together to keep things from shifting around on you, and then cut out the traced outline. To get this last little bit of skirt, I cut out a triangle of approximately the right size, erring on the side of caution and making it a little bigger than needed. And now, of course, I need to sew those two seams. So, 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 and the lining layer is done. I have a few different layers going on here. From bottom to top, we have the thicker 7 ounce linen, which will be the outer fabric, and then two layers of the lighter 3.5 ounce linen, the lining and the uh, inner lining. And then on top, we have a strip of the green 7 ounce linen. Once I'm satisfied with the placement of that green strip, I'll fold the lining back, cut the thick white linen to make space for the green. If you do something similar, Make sure you remember to uh, include seam allowance before cutting. I will sew along this long edge of the white and the green on the machine for speed, you know, but to finish off this top corner, I'd like it to be very precise, so I'll do this bit by hand. I folded the seam allowance back and then carefully pinned it in place. Unlike most of my seams, I will not iron this one open, but instead I'm going to iron it towards the darker fabric. The white fabric's pretty opaque, but it's still possible to see the seam allowance folded over through the outside of the garment, so we'll just fix that by shoving everything towards the green side. For hand stitching, I'm going with a fairly small and extra tidy stitch, since this is up kind of high and chest height, and will be quite visible if I am at all messy with my stitching. I don't mind being lazy when it comes to stitching things you can't see, but this line is worth the extra effort and time to make it look nice. I decided to do a quick loose backstitch up the length of the machine sewn section as well, 
mostly to keep the seam allowance pressed to the green side. I'll repeat all of the cutting and sewing so far so that I have two of these white and green pieces, but you know, reversed of course. I'll tuck the prepared linings under the fashion fabric panels. Let's focus on just one for a second, and I have it flipped over so that the lining is now on top. Pin all three layers together, and then we'll get these skirt triangles sorted out. I need to add some white fabric right here and some green fabric over here. Using chalk, I'm marking the green fabric and then cutting along that same mark. Don't forget to check the grain line. Currently, I'm looking at two parallel straight grain edges. We want to flip the triangle over so that the bias is touching the selvage. Pin the seam and then this is ready to be sewn. So, 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 so. Iron the seam open. We've got a little bit of extra here, but we can trim that away later. Repeat the same triangle steps for the white half of the panel. Cut out the triangle, flip it, pin it to the body, sew the pin seam, iron the seam allowance open, and ta-da! I would like to reduce the number of pins currently being held hostage by this dress panel, so I'll add a row of basting stitches all around the edge. Reclaim those pins back, and then trim off some of this excess fabric around the edges. Time to join our two halves. Line the edges up, pin them together, and sew. Iron the seams open, and then we'll have a pair of dress quarters. The base pieces are all done, so we need to tackle those ermine spots. I thought it might be fun to do some fabric stamping, so I got out a block of wood topped with linoleum. I don't need this whole thing, just this little top section. I sketched out a cute little ermine spot, and then had the bottom part removed. Then using a speedball linoleum cutter, I started carving away the bits of the design that I didn't want in the final print. Side note, you really shouldn't be cutting towards your fingers like this. I strongly recommend using a bench hook to hold the block in place while you cut. I couldn't find mine, so I went ahead without it, because I am terribly foolish. I did, in fact, end up cutting my finger despite being careful, so, you know, FYI. I did a few test prints on some scrap linen, and while they turned out okay, I didn't like the faded parts in the middle. A proper printing setup might have changed that, but in lieu of having that, I decided to try stenciling instead. I have some stenciling plastic around, so I put it on top of the ermine block and traced the design in marker. I cut out the bits I didn't want and tried a few more practice tests on scrap fabric. Immediately, I love how much darker and solid the design turned out. I think I am sold on stenciling instead of stamping. Following the paint directions, I've given the paint 24 hours to dry, and now the instructions say to iron the paint to sort of heat set it, which I've always done before, but I'm kind of curious if it actually makes a difference. So my very unscientific test is to iron the right half of the stamp designs and this one stenciled spot too. I did some quick zigzag stitches around the raw edge of the test and then tossed the thing in the wash. Once it was dry, I gave the whole thing a once over with the iron and I guess the heat setting did in fact make a slight difference. The heat side stayed darker, so I guess the instructions on the bottle have a point. Huh, who knew? I am not 100% sure where I want those ermine spots to go, so I'm spraying a few spots on paper and then cutting them out to make some quick, movable spots. This way I can play around with placement and spacing before committing to actually painting them in. Be aware that the paint might seep through the fabric, and maybe prepare a bit of cardboard to place under the fabric as you paint. Now, go nuts with painting! Dab, dab, dab. Right, Christine? Don't forget to iron the spots once the paint has had a day to dry. Let's get this leaf started. I have four layers of fabric here, a thick red and a thick white linen, and then two layers of a very thin white silk. Your initial inclination might be to orient the grain of the fabric straight down the middle of the sleeve pattern, but I'm going to make the grain go approximately with the longer side seam. I've read that this is a better thing to do for tight sleeves since it puts things slightly on a bias. Let's give it a try. Trace around the paper pattern with your preferred fabric marking device, and then cut out all four layers at once. 
The white sleeve needs some ermine spots to match the body of the dress, so we'll paint those on with the same stencil. Once it's dry, check that you have two mirrored sleeves and then fold them in half and check again that you still have a pair of mirrored sleeves. It's a pain in the butt if you accidentally make uh, two left sleeves, so double check before you sew. Sew up the sleeve seam and then iron the sleeve open like usual. If you don't have a sleeve ironing board, which I don't, then just grab something sturdy and firmly wrap it in fabric or a towel. Repeat that for both sleeves and sleeve linings. Turn the fabric right side out, but leave the linings wrong side out. Check that you have the right lining for the right fashion fabric by comparing the top curve where the seam terminates. Toss the linings inside. I, of course, ended up undoing this later in order to tighten the fit of the sleeves a bit, but eh, if your sleeve pattern fits perfectly, then this method is great. The shoulders need to be together so that we can sew those sleeves in. I don't want to sew the lining in the seam just yet, so I'll separate that out and then just sew the other four layers. I'll stitch down the seam allowance to keep things neat and trim and flat, and then fold the lining inward and pin it in place while I whip the two edges together. The sleeve and the body are ready to be sewn together. Woo! Pin a billion pins until the sleeve head looks something like this. Sew the arm side, removing pins as you go, unless you like to live dangerously, in which case, leave the pins in. Okay, look at that beautiful sl Oh, looks like I got a wee little pleat in there. So I'll seam rip that open, I guess, and re-sew that spot. All right, there we go, much better. Repeat all of that for the red sleeves. If you are like me and are constantly trying to shove a slightly too big sleeve into a smaller armhole area, then try gathering the sleeve with a running stitch. Use a sturdy thread so you can then pull on the thread and gather the sleeve as needed. Pin the sleeve inside the arm side until you've used all the pins in the entire room and then sew that sleeve in. Let's see if I did any better with this one. Nope. Still have a big old pleat. All right, seam rip. Try again. <laughs> it's not perfect, but that's good enough. The bodice front and neckline still have raw edges to take care of. I could do a double fold like this, but I thought that would end up looking too bulky. Instead, I'm gonna go with some unnecessarily time intensive nonsense instead. Base a little further in from the edge, because I'm about to remove the based edge here that we did at the beginning. I want the finished edge to be exactly half an inch from the cut edge, and I don't trust markers in such a highly visible area, so let's do some running stitches with a ruler guide to keep it at precisely the correct seam allowance. Then I can fold the extra under using that stitched line as a reference point, and keep the seam allowance tacked down with a quick row of stitches. I won't be taking these out later, so I'll try to keep them extra neat and tidy on the outside. We still have the lining hanging out here, so we'll want to fold it under just past the visible edge and then stitch it in place. I'm using something vaguely whip stitch like. It's pretty, right? Guys, we are ready to join the two halves of the dress. I'll pin the back seam together, sew it up, and iron flat. I'm doing the front seam next, but I want to make sure that the top is perfectly even first and then move on to actually pinning the skirt portion. Sew this and then we'll iron open like always. To finish the seam, I'll trim the lining down to about a quarter inch and then fold the longer top edge allowance over the trimmed edge. You could do this without the trimming, it would just be a little bulkier. Whip stitch the folded allowance down, trying to grab just the white lining if possible, rather than letting the needle go all the way through to the front of the fabric. I went ahead and did most of the eyelets for the front opening. I have set up my lacing holes for the spiral lacing method, which means that we'll want the top two holes to be mirrored, but it's all sort of offset nonsense after that. <laughs> 
See how I have these two close holes on the red up here? After that extra cozy eyelet, the rest are set in a sort of zigzag pattern. Search for spiral lacing to learn more about that. To make a new eyelet, I'll poke a hole with an awl, and then I like to have my thread starting on the outside of the garment, so I'll poke it through to the other side and start my stitches by going down through the all made hole and back up just next to the previous stitch. With each stitch, lightly pull to keep the uh, hole open. You can make a far uh, denser eyelet with really close stitches, much closer than what I'm doing here, but I'm lazy and I find that just doing 10 stitches is enough to make the eyelet perfectly functional. Here's the same step on the green fabric. I know that it can be a little tough on some screens to see what's going on on the red. Poke a hole, stitch, 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 stitch. Now I can try the dress on. All in all, I'm pretty ding dang pleased. The upper sleeves are a little big, uh, but the flared cuff is so cute. I need a couple more eyelets at the bottom here, and I should probably also get rid of all of these basting stitches at some point. The primary construction is done, so it's mostly cleanup efforts now. To tame the raw edges where the sleeve meets the shoulder, I'm just gonna run it through a quick zigzag stitch on the sewing machine. Now, I'm just gonna leave it like this, but if you wanted to do a more period seam treatment, I'd recommend covering the seam allowance with a woven or bias tape. Again, I'm lazy, so I'm just gonna leave it at faux surging. I've been pretty loosey-goosey about the hem, so it's very uneven at the moment. There's no point in the green side being longer than the red, so let's trim them evenly so both sides match. Then I'll fold the hem under two inches deep all the way around, and then try it on to see how much more it needs to be hemmed. I don't know why I bothered wearing a shift under for the hemming, but that's just what you do, I guess. It's looking good! The center of each front panel is maybe a little too high, it's not quite touching the floor, whereas the actual like center front is a couple inches too long. I don't want it dragging under my feet and tripping me, so let's pin that up a little higher. And that's definitely better. We'll refine it a bit once it's flat on the table again. My smallest bit of a hem is about one inch deep, so I'll cut all the rest of the hem to match. Then I just turn the edge inward and stitch. Try not to let your stitches show on the outside of the fabric though. Or if you'd rather not hand sew, you can try your luck at machine blind hemming. Sorry Bernadette. If done correctly, this shouldn't be visible on the outside. I can start removing some of those basting stitches. So exciting. So for the sleeves, I've lined up the seam on the red and lining fabric and I'll toss some whip stitches around the edge to secure it in place. I got some very cute little wee buttons from Billy and Charlie. I'll link to their pewter reproduction items down below. Their buttons are so much nicer than mine. Highly recommend. I had sort of forgotten <laughs> that I wanted to do buttons on the sleeves here, so I had to seam rip the, the wrist area of the sleeve open, and I'll stitch it kind of just like you see it pinned here. Whip, 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 stitch. Again, proving that I am a lazy noodle, I didn't feel like making a bunch of hand-stitched buttonholes. I didn't even feel like making a bunch of machine buttonholes. But I did want buttons, so I cheated. After measuring out the placement of each button, I pierced through the fabric by making a hole with an awl, just big enough to get the button shank through, and then I kept the button in place with a pin. Then I stitched the other side to the button shank from inside the sleeve. I used rather loose, loopy stitches since I didn't draft the sleeves here to be all that tight. If you need your sleeves to actually button and unbutton, then this method is decidedly not for you. But it is a rather convincing way to make a sort of faux button up sleeve and I think it looks really good and works well. Now that the sleeves are done, let's try it on again and take a look. The dress fits well and I feel pretty dang cute. I'm really happy with how these buttons turned out, but I feel like I'm missing something. Hmm.
Let me go look over some of those medieval ladies again. <gasps> you know what? I think I might need some tippets. Okay, so these are sort of a silly accessory. They're sort of a vestigial sleeve tail, but they are kind of cute, and they're present in a bunch of late 14th century dresses, so I think I'm gonna make a pair of very simple ones, just making one really long rectangle and turning it right side out. I'm adding a sturdy cord with a knot at the end to the inside of the casing, which will make it easier to turn. Iron it flat and crisp, and size it to whatever you want on your arm. I'm making mine foolishly long, because extra. The armband part needs to be just a little bit bigger than the bicep. Mine is maybe a little too long here. Turn the raw fabric edges inward and stitch the ends closed. I pinned them in a circle and then opened a small part of the side seam here with a seam ripper. That's where I'm going to tuck in the hanging part of the tippet. Make sure that the two are even and match each other nicely and then stitch everything in place. I'm afraid I didn't get any footage of the tippets being stitched in place, but I can show me removing them so that you at least kind of get an idea of how it was done. And we're all done! Da 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 da! Now begins the weird narcissistic montage in the park section of today's video. I went for green socks. I thought that green and red might be a little too on the nose. Your branches are looking very twiggy today. Ah, yes, a random path in the woods. Let's see where this goes. That's never how horror movies begin. I hope you guys enjoyed the longer video. I've received some feedback requesting exactly that. This project took me a lot longer than I expected, but hopefully the wait was worth it. If you make your own 14th century gown inspired by my video, heraldic or not, I would love to see it. Tag me on Instagram at Morgan Donner. Good night everyone and happy sewing. Nom 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 nom. Pose. Oh, Tippet. No. Tippets.